out here today. My name is Amanda Hutter. I own and operate Greenfeed Ecosystem Services and we are out here today for our day with a dog sledder. I'm so happy you guys could arrive on time but we're actually going to be doing these videos throughout the entire day. We have videos that are shot live on the trails. We have videos from other mushers. We have video content from professionals and researchers across uh, Canada that are doing work in dog sledding and we're going to be sharing all of that with you guys today. The reason we're doing all of this is because we want to promote dog sledding. We want to promote the health of the sport and what a great sport it is for both the dogs and people. We're also doing some fundraising for a great event that we're doing on March 5th, the Can-Am Crown International Race. We're taking six of our pets that we run with to this race and we're going to be having a great time. So we're doing a little bit of fundraising for that race too. That's in T-minus six days from this point right now. So we're doing fundraising, donate if you can, share the donation page if you want to. Otherwise, in exchange, we're giving you a whole bunch of information and education about dog sledding throughout the day. So yeah, a little bit about Greenfeed Ecosystem Services. We're actually an environmental company. We do environmental restoration and protection. We focus on enjoyment as well of ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are like those great things that you get from nature and they're free. Recreation in nature is one of them and that's why we do dog sledding with things like things like this. Because getting out with a carbon free mode of transportation is a really great way to get along trails, learn about these forests and wetlands and trail systems throughout Bruce County, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Traditional Territory um, and all the areas around well anywhere anywhere in the world dog sledding can be done so we're going to show you a little bit about how to do that how to get into the sport training tips along the way so everything about dog sledding is going to be featured today we can't go through everything but we're going to try to do our best so let's take a little a little walk to the pen and we'll we'll start to meet some of our dogs so this sled that i've got here is actually the racing sled that we're going to be taking on our race. It's called a thunder sled and it was built by Lou, sorry, by Doug McNeil a long time ago and then it was raised by a very famous Iditarod musher, Lou Sayre. So we have this same, this same sled and it was actually signed by a fella named Lance Mackey. You can see the signature right on the front here. This was from back before we got into racing. And a friend of mine remade this bag for me and then got Lance Mackey to sign it. Lance Mackey is a really famous musher and we really love what he did because he, he took a lot of uh, dogs that nobody wanted, he put them together, he raced with them and he, he used that racing and that dog sledding to get through really, really big challenges in life for himself too. So great role model. But um, so we're gonna be using this sled today. And today I'm taking the racing team out and we're gonna be driving through Fort Elgin and Southampton to get them used to the noises and the excitement and the distractions that happen when you're in town. And so, so today's gonna be a big day. family her family kennel we also have another another kennel that we use for all of the pets that we use because what we do with green <coughs> differently Gracie, we run dog setting in a little bit of a different way where we actually use pets that's right we use pets so these dogs they're not bred for racing they're not bred for dog sledding they're huskies they're working dogs and they're dogs that want to pull we love dogs like that and so what owners do is they bring them to us they start with training and then they get trained oh, this is zorro this is our zorro zorro's a funny boy from alaskan husky he lives at the family kennel and he actually had seven different homes that came to live with us. 
<laughs> he gets picked on by one of the other dogs, and I'll, I'll tell you guys a little bit about that later. So he was a rescue, and after all seven homes, this home became his became his home. You can see he's a really good boy. And uh, Dad might be able to introduce him a little better than I can, because Dad, who's just walking up the way here, <laughs> can tell you a little bit about his history. So, so what we do... Uh, we have a lot of dogs that are rescues. We have a lot of dogs that are pets. So a lot of dogs that were bed, um, born through breeding programs. Uh, and their owners decided that, man, they have a lot of energy. Huskies might be a lot of work for me. So they come to us and we train them. We take them out on little adventures and little runs and little rides in the snow and on the wheels too. We start in the, in the fall uh, with dry land mushing training and we start running them at about 200 meter distances. And then at this point in the season, we're up to 50 kilometer distances. So incrementally over time, we work with the owners on diet, we work with them on exercise, we work with them on vet care, we work with them on behavioral issues, and, and we take them out on adventures. So, so every single dog that we run in particular has a really unique story. Uh, a lot, a lot of the dogs we get to know a little bit more about just through their owners because they're really just like the extra eyes, um, the extra hands. Uh, because when we work across 28 dogs, uh, we like to make sure that there's some one-on-one -on -one attention with every one of the dogs, and that's that's the role of the. Um, the dog owners, uh, they live in families, so those dog owners become really important and really helpful for us when we run our, our teams because sometimes the dogs will get home and maybe they have a crack on their paw that we didn't see because it's night time when we stopped running. Or maybe somebody's got diarrhea and we just didn't catch it on the trails. Um, so the dog owners let us know about things like this and so pretty much once we're done our runs until about the next day, we're still talking with the dog owners about the the uh, previous run. So it's a really good setup that we run. It's not a standard type of a dog sledding operation, but there is there is really no two dog sledding operations that operate the same. Every single kennel, every single dog owner, every single way of doing dog sledding is very different. So we're just going to be showing you a lot today about how we do things and then we're going to show you a lot about how other people do things as well. Uh, we <laughs> we encourage a lot of the dog owners to uh, to connect with some of the groups that we're connected to. Uh, Ontario Federation of Sled Dog Sports, Mush with Pride, International Sled Dog Sports Association. There's a lot of different associations that create uh, standards for dog sledders to make sure that the dogs are getting great care, uh, great attention, they stay in great health. And we, we not only follow the standards, we, we try to exceed them in every way shape and form possible so we have a really nice team we have we have teams that have a lot of character and they have really great homes to get to at the end of the day right right then in the summer times they get the summer time off uh, we get a lot of questions about what do the dogs do in the summertime for us the dogs go on camping trips with their owners they go on hikes along the Bruce Trail they go on road trips they go to family reunions, you know, they're part of families and we treat them like part of our family as well. So, so they are dogs, so they do need to have dog care. Uh, so lots of times Huskies don't like being inside, especially this guy, he doesn't like being inside for longer than an hour. And you can see why, if you were sitting inside with like three layers of a coat, you would be pretty hot too. So probably about a quarter of the dogs that we work with They've decided, uh, the dogs themselves have decided that they want to stay outside at night. And it gets cold at night and they are habituated to that. And you can see, if you can get a close up here, I'll just do an example on Bandit. <laughs> this is, this is the, un the fuzzy undercoat that Huskies usually have and it's pure fluff. There is a lot of hair here to keep them warm. So they have no problems being outside in the winter time. For higher metabolism, dogs like, like Zorro, he stays outside too. His high metabolism gets his gets his house up to about plus five when it's when it's minus twenty outside because he's got such a high metabolism. He heats up the 
he heats up the insulated houses that ah uh, that they have so we encourage all the owners to have insulated dog houses access to fresh uh fresh water every single day clean pens clean areas if they if they do stay outside but they're never outside 24 7. <laughs> like with pets they're never outside 24 7. um it's um oof sometimes <laughs> i know so so yeah, so they've got a lot of character. Oh, they, so we try to work with work with their characters as best that we can. Some of the dogs are faster and stronger, like this guy. He sometimes runs in lead, and then he can be what he wants to be. He wants to be a dog that wants to run fast and he wants to pull. So we give them the chance to do that because they're huskies. They like pulling. In their genetics is programmed to pull. In their digestive systems, it's programmed to digest food in a different way than humans digest food. Um, there's something called um, your your blood to oxygen ratio, and dogs have husky dogs, performing and working dogs, have a very high percentage of blood oxygen to oh, oh ratio VOC <laughs> it's called. So. And we'll we'll switch to a little clip and a little bit about a little bit about that to explain it a little a little bit more. Arlie Reynolds can can tell you a little bit more about the science behind that since we're getting distracted by these guys. They're gonna get antsy to go soon. But some other dogs like to run slower, like Bandit right below. He runs a little bit slower, but he's incredibly strong. You can see he has a it's a built-up chest, lots of muscle. So he doesn't go fast. He's got small, he's got shorter, a little bit shorter legs. He's a little bit bigger than his. And so we usually run him in the middle because then he can run strong and slower. So these two dogs, front, fast, back, slow. So every one of the dogs we try to we try to fit onto the team according to their characteristics of their bodies and their characters. So so for every one of the dogs. As long as they like pulling and they want to pull, that's their first step in having them invited onto our teams that we work with. And there's no shortage of dog owners that can testify that dogs love pulling. Husky dogs definitely love pulling. So, right? Right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the thing about having dogs with lots of different characters that are coming from different families is that sometimes there's a lot of energy and because there's hierarchies in packs of dogs uh, just like wolves sometimes dogs fight for different positions in the hierarchy and we don't really stand in the way of that we just try to mitigate fights from happening so what we do is um, for a lot of for a lot of kennels we do have tethers you can see Randall here he's, he's on we can show you some clips of him he's got a free life he comes home with me but he sometimes will pick on one of our other dogs here. And so what we do to control that, especially before runs when they're really, really excited and they have a lot of energy and they're trying to find ways to displace that energy. If they're if they're prone to biting when they're trying to displace that energy, then we'll try to control the bite tethering them. They still have their, they still have their insulated dog houses. You see it happening right there with Zorro. So you can see it's starting to happen here. They, they start kind of, trying to sort through their hierarchies and stuff like that by nipping at each other. And so we keep them tethered. They have 10 foot tethers, um, insulated dog houses. They still have access to clean, fresh water every day. But we use these tethers to control any kinds of aggression that'll happen, especially around when we're feeding after the runs. If you can imagine having eight dogs all in a pen, they're all from different homes. And if you lay down eight bowls of dog food, what do you think is gonna happen, right? I want what you've got and then they start fighting and then so so we use these tethers to control some of the aggression they still have lots of room to to run around but they're never 90% of the time they're outside they're running they're with their families and because we have other uh, other dogs from other families here at the family panel uh, pen today then we're we we don't want to damage anybody's dogs <laughs> so we have to have these ways to keep them safe and that's what we do so we have these swivels on the top of them so that they can swing them around they don't get caught um metal posts so that they don't chew them and yeah and then a shelter if they want to get away from some of the other dogs so that's yeah so that's my guy and uh <laughs> can show you some of the clips of him uh, 
of him, yeah, of him at the house sometimes. Okay, all right, with all we've just been talking about, let's get to some of the pros and some dog owners themselves. So while I get ready, I'm gonna get some of these on. We're gonna talk with some of the dog owners and learn a little bit about all of these pets that we run with. So let's start with my dad. Hello. Take it away, dad. <laughs> Obviously, I'm Amanda's dad. I'm Dick Hutter, and uh, we're actually in Takamak Kennel, and it's a small recreational kennel. It used to be a racing kennel, but we stopped that about uh, oh, 25 years ago and went strictly recreational. And uh, whereas initially we were doing just breeding uh, racing Siberians, uh, when we went recreational, uh, we decided to go with just rescuing and adopting in dogs. Dogs from kennels that were downsizing, dogs that were uh, uh, residential pets and were in the wrong environment. Uh, kennels, uh, dogs from uh, on Kijiji. <laughs> so we're pretty picky about the dogs we pick since we have a self-imposed limit of about eight dogs. So whoever we do bring in, um, we, we do it on a one week trial and if they pass the mental and physical <laughs> acuity tests, uh, then they stay at the kennel. And uh, presently we have six dogs and uh, we'll gather them up and I'll introduce uh, some of them to you that are on the team, on Mandy's team. <laughs> this is Gracie. Gracie's one of our younger dogs. She's about four years old. She's, uh, she's the only female we have, and she's an alpha female. She's uh, unlike regular females in that she wants to establish her dominance over the, all the dogs. When we first got her, she had to have an altercation with every single dog in the pen. She was challenging even the top dog. Anyway, she's a really good sled dog. Despite her behavioral issues, she's a darn good sled dog. She loves to pull, don't you? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, you're always getting in trouble, aren't you? Uh -huh. This is Zorro. This is our senior leader right now. He's, uh, he's about nine years old. Or no, about seven. <laughs> Seven years old, yeah, yeah, you're, you're not a grandfather yet. <laughs> Anyways, he's a real feisty guy. We got him when he was about uh, a year old. And he came from a, he came from a, a residential home that he was tearing apart. But he knows now how to expend his energy and he does it very well. He's a very good leader. Knows all his commands really well, but he can be stubborn. Stubborn as they come. Sometimes he wants to contest me on the commands. <laughs> Don't you? Yeah. But he's a lovable dog, very sociable, very friendly. But everyone, everyone always challenges him, so that's what happens when you're the top dog. <laughs> now this is Striker. He's the youngest dog in our kennel. He's about two years old. He's basically our our last adopted in dog. <laughs> we're, we're trying to downsize. So uh, I promised the wife this was the last one we're bringing in. But he's uh, he's been trained as a command leader. He knew how to run a, lead a team when he was about a year old. Uh, so he's sort of a backup leader right now, as he's learning the ropes. His reliability on commands is getting better all the time. Not nearly where it should be, but uh, he's a very, very most gentle and friendly dog. Eh, aren't you? Aren't you? He's so lovable. So right now he basically runs in, in swing, and sometimes we rotate him in the lead. So this is Bandit. Bandit is our nine-year-old dog. <laughs> he's a he's a command trained leader as well. But we rarely use him as a leader. 
He just prefers to be a wheel dog. So he just, he just likes to follow. But in a pinch or in an emergency, we can, we can use it. He does know his commands. Anyways, he's, again, a very friendly dog. Uh, there's a bit of Malamute in him. That's why he has a much bigger bill and a lot longer fur. He's been uh, a very good dog on the team. Very strong. Good, powerful dog for a wheel. Tend to sled along uh, around uh, bends, tight bends, and up hills. So a nice addition to the team. Where did he come from? Yeah, where did you come from? <laughs> he came from London. He was a residential pet. And the same issue with him, as a residential pet, he was just in the wrong environment. And uh, he was uh, he was chewing up rugs and chairs and uh, table legs, digging holes in the backyard. So, uh, so he found himself a new home. And here he can, he can dig to his heart's content and he loves to run. Don't you? Huh? You're a good boy, aren't you? which attracts my attention. So I come out, they stop, and then I can hear a group group A over there <laughs> howling, and then they'll stop, and then group B will start howling, you know, to, to, to the north, and then they'll stop, and then ours will start up again. So, uh, so it's a, a largely a territorial thing. Plus, they do it if one of the one of the pack is missing. So if I take a dog for a walk or bring him inside, the rest of the dogs realize he's gone, and uh, and and they howl to either draw him back <laughs> or to voice their disappointment that they're not the ones that got the treatment to go inside the house. <laughs> So we're gonna get, we're gonna do this as quick as we can to intro how the sled is set up. So when you're dog sledding, you have to have a couple of safety things and you have to have a couple of standard things. Standard things on the sled are in here, ice hooks, which I tuck in here or I tuck on the front. Your line, you need a line for the dogs to pull. You need a sled. You definitely need a sled to do dog sledding. And you definitely need an anchor line, which we call a snub line. Now these are quick release lines and you can see we have the sled attached to a good sturdy post. This is actually at my parents' place right now. So dad's put these in just for doing dog sledding. So I should credit him to it. So these quick releases that we use, there's a couple of different kinds of them. These are actually for horses, but what they do, they have a little arrow on them. So they're really simple. You can't forget it. You slide them down. And they, and they release, and then we wrap it around the sled. These are important because when you start lining up the dogs, then your sled doesn't take off. <laughs> and you have a whole sled full of dogs running wild, and ah, it's just a muck. So we attach them. And most of the times we have a, second line, a secondary line just in case this one snaps too. Um, so we have all of our gear inside here as well. This flips open. This gear has all of our extra equipment. I carry an extra hook for the front so that if I need to stop, then I can secure the dogs at the front with a smaller hook. And I'm actually carrying a whole bag of dog food in here, a, a 20 kilogram bag of dog food at the bottom of this, this sled, just to put some extra weight to train these dogs because they're fast. They're fast as all sin. So we have all of our safety stuff, extra equipment in our bag. We have extra food. We always carry extra food. We carry lights for the dogs if we get caught on the, on the trails at nighttime. Uh, we have booties for the dogs if we need those, first aid kits, um, and I always bring zip ties. Zip ties are my friend. This stuff breaks all the time. I bring extra necklines in case I need to secure the dog somewhere or add some extra sections on the lines, or in the case that somebody wants to put their dog on the sled. <laughs> I'm kidding, but sometimes it does happen. 
Uh, we have ref reflective bends on our, on our sleds that in the case that we're on the roads, especially at night, we like to stay well lit. And that's why we also have safety vests at the bottom of the bag here too. Especially if we're on roads because we're running out of trails around, around this area for dog sledding. So then when we're clipping up the sleds, this one's kind of a funky sled. Usually we have ash sleds. This one's the racing sled that we're gonna be taking to this race, with, to this race which you should all throw in a donation to. Make sure you click the donation button and donate to the race so that we can support all these dogs. So this sled actually wiggles back and forth. This is a modern sled, so it goes like this. And that helps us to turn. It's very light. This one was built by Doug McNeil and he's just a genius for sled building. So we have it attached at the bottom. This is where we have one of our uh, ice hooks attached to, so that the ice hook, when we're securing the dogs temporarily, is attached to the line of dogs, not the sled, otherwise you'll break your sled. This is a team section. Hey, Willow Pillow. There's our lead dog there. <laughs> She's helping you. Are you helping me, Willow? Come and help. Come help. This is a team section. We've got two lines. We run them in tandem lines. Uh, they, historically, they used to be run in single lines or up in northern, uh, northern Canada, um, uh, Turtle Island traditional territory. At the very far north, they'd run them in split fan lines. Um, and we don't, we don't do that here, but those split fan lines used to distribute the weight across the ice, which we should probably be doing. And then we have neck lines. The neck lines are attached to the dogs. These two at the back, I have a longer line because Randall sometimes, I don't know, <laughs> one of the dogs likes to get away from the other dogs. And then we have a second team line because I have six dogs, so two, four, six. And this is our lead line here. So there's no neck lines except for just holding the two dogs that are going to be at the front together. And so that's our setup for the sled that we are bringing for the race. We have a whole bunch of extra equipment that we're going to be taking for the actual race. But that's how you set up a dog sled. We're going to be taking off here in just a minute. So we'll probably break to, a, to another little section for a bit. And then we are going to get the dogs lined up, taking off. Make sure you check out that link for doing donations to the, uh, to the dog sled race that we're doing. And uh, we'll carry on in just a, just a minute with more doggy education. Yeah.